testing, testing. One, two, three. Good morning, good morning. Testing, testing, we're glad you're here. Testing, testing, folks at home, welcome. Do uh, say hello in the chat, let us know if you can hear us. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Are we good? Yeah. All right, KG says we're good. So welcome everyone, welcome back to Adult Ed. It is good to be back with all of you after a couple weeks off. Uh, thank you all for being here. Friends at home, you are very, very welcome to join in the conversation. And the way you can do that is in the chat on the Facebook live stream. I am watching the comments here on Facebook. And there is a little bit of a lag, but I will do my best to bring all of your comments into the conversation. As you can see, there is a little bit of a lag. <laughs> but we very much want you to participate as well. So if you're watching at home, please go ahead and say hi in the Facebook chat and feel free to jump into the conversation anytime. So before we dig into our class this morning, I wanna let everybody know about a couple of other adult ed things that are starting soon. Uh, next week here in the Perspectives class, next Sunday at 940, we are starting a brand new unit. Uh, and this is a unit that I think is gonna be pretty exciting. We are using a DVD curriculum called The Difficult Words of Jesus, A Beginner's Guide to His Most Perplexing Teachings. And this is a DVD series by a New Testament scholar named Amy Jill Levine. She was actually one of Pastor Kyle's professors in seminary. She's a New Testament scholar, and she herself is Jewish. And so she is able to shed a lot of light onto New Testament passages in light of how Jesus's original audiences would have heard and understood and interpreted his words. Uh, so each week is going to focus on a different difficult or confusing saying of Jesus. And Amy Jill Levine is going to help us understand uh, how Jesus's original hearers might have understood it and how we can understand it better. So that's gonna be a great series. Next week, the fabulous Eve Gardner is going to be our facilitator, kicking off our series. <laughs> and each week we'll have a little bit of teaching from Amy Jo Levine, and then there will also be time for conversation. So we really encourage all of you to tune in for that, either here in the chapel or online via live stream, starting next Sunday. Stephanie? Yes, Emily. Is having the book something that would be helpful, or will we be able to follow along with that, or what do you uh -huh. think? Okay, so yeah, that's a great question. Emily asked about the book. So there is a, it's a DVD and there's a leader's guide. There is also a regular book book that goes with it. You do not need it, but if anyone would like it to read along, you can certainly do that. Um, you can contact Hearts and Minds if you would like to order a copy, and I bet they'll even give you a bit of a discount. <laughs> so if you want the book, you can certainly get that as an adjunct, but you don't need it. You can just come. <laughs> Um, another cool thing that's going to be starting up this Wednesday, the Wednesday night Zoom Bible study that meets every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. is starting a new series this Wednesday, and we are going to be looking at the Gospel of Matthew. This is a really um, fun and thoughtful and curious group every Wednesday from 7 to 8.30 on Zoom. We get together and read scripture and talk about it. Um, so everyone is invited to be a part of that, and this will be a great time to jump in because we're starting, we're starting Matthew, so that'll be great. Matthew is the gospel that the lectionary this year is focusing on, so we'll probably be hearing snippets of it fairly frequently in worship. So this will be a great chance to get the sense of how the whole book flows together and how those stories we're going to hear read and preached on fit into the broader um, gospel. So that's every Wednesday night, starting this Wednesday from 7 to 8.30 on Zoom. And the link is on the church website, or you can contact me if you want me to send it to you. All right, so uh, as always, we also have our Sunday evening Zoom prayer tonight at 7. That's about 20 or 30 minutes, and the link for that is on the church website as well. And of course, we have other Bible studies going on throughout the week, like our mom's Bible study and our Pathfinder study with Wendy Smith. So, lots of opportunities in this new year to get more involved in adult ed. Well, but today, we are going to have a special class focusing on some art that is going to help us think about epiphany and about the baptism of Christ. 
So as you recall, if you were with us during Advent, each week during Advent, we were looking at some visual art that helped us explore the themes of Advent. And we did that for four weeks. And if anybody wants to check those out, the recordings are online. And of course, after Advent, we had Christmas. We have 12 days of Christmas because Christmas is a whole season, not just one day. And then after those 12 days, we have this set of special days on the church calendar that help us think more deeply and understand more fully who that baby is who was born in the manger. So we have 12 days after Christmas on January 6th, we have Epiphany, which was this past Friday. And then the Sunday after Epiphany, we have the celebration of the baptism of Christ, which is today. And so both of those events in tandem help us understand more about who this baby whose birth we just celebrated is. So we're going to look at a few pieces of art that will help us think about this uh, set of celebrations. So to start us off, when we talk about Epiphany, in addition to being a date on the church calendar, it's also just a word in the English language, right? Someone might say, I had an epiphany. What does that mean? What does the word epiphany mean? An awakening. An awakening? Great. What else? Revelation. A revelation. Ooh. Manifestation. Manifestation. An aha moment. An aha moment. Some people might think of it as like a light bulb going off in your head. So on the day of Epiphany, all of those things, an aha moment, a manifestation, a revelation, a seeing more clearly, um, is what we find out about baby Jesus. And the lens through which we typically have that Epiphany is through the story of the visitation of the man. So we're going to start off by reading this Epiphany scripture passage, and then we're going to look at a couple of pieces of art. So if you all wouldn't mind grabbing your Bibles, folks at home, you can grab your Bible as well. And we are going to look at <coughs> Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Is there somebody who would volunteer to read that really loudly for us? Go for it, Chris. All right, Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and had come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written, that you, Bethlehem, in the land of Ju Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. And Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to, to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, 
who were two years old, two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the man. Thanks, Chris. So this story is a roller coaster. We've got highs, we've got terror. What sort of aha moments about Jesus do we have as we read this story? What sort of revelations do we see about who Jesus is as we read about the wise men's actions? Folks at home, you can chime in in the comment section. Well, he's fulfilling, right? He's fulfillment of prophecies. Fulfillment of prophecies, yeah. What else? I'm always struck by the fact that it's just so much bigger than the, the kingdom of Israel. It, 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 this is, you know, you've got people traveling from way far away who are seeing cosmic events to, you know, um, to come. Yeah, that's a great observation. These, these magi who come from far away, from distant lands, being guided by the celestial being, you know, bodies. Yeah, the, the bigness, the cosmicness of it. What other epiphanies might we have as we read this story? I think the king realized how big of an event this was and was fearful. Yeah, King Herod feels threatened. Yeah. And he has reason to. He doesn't react in the right way, but he's on to something. Yes, Ellie. I've been, because of the Advent devotions, I've been a little more focused on Joseph and his role, because we don't hear anything he says, but this is another example that he becomes the key player in moving the baby and his mother to safety. Yeah, yeah, so we're learning more about Joseph's role. And that that entails escape. Mm -hmm. Being refugees, even. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, this scene, this story of the visitation by the Magi, as you might expect, is depicted in lots and lots of art uh, all through the ages. Um, so we're just going to look at one really famous example, and we have a little five-minute video here that's going to help us uh, learn a little bit more about this famous painting. This is the Adoration of the Magi by Botticelli, which was painted in Italy around 1475. So let's watch this clip and see what this uh, painting might help us notice about this story. Welcome to Art for Epiphany. This is a bonus video in the Art for Advent series. During Advent, we looked at a painting of the Annunciation by the 15th century Florentine painter Sandro Botticelli. On Epiphany, a day when Christians observe the arrival of the Magi, we look at Botticelli's Adoration of the Magi. One of Botticelli's most celebrated paintings this work includes a self-portrait of the artist, standing at the right, dressed in an ochre-colored mantle. Botticelli looks out at the viewer. This welcomes us into the picture and invites us to join the illustrious company. Botticelli's adoration of the Magi is also renowned because it features portraits of many famous citizens of Florence. Among the Magi and their attendants are members of the Medici family, who were the veritable rulers of Renaissance Florence. The elderly Magi, who kneels before Christ, is none other than Cosimo de' Medici. It was Cosimo who established the Medici as Florence's leading political and banking family. However, Cosimo had died more than a decade before Botticelli's Adoration of the Magi was painted. The Medici family, as well as Florence itself, was now led by his grandson, Lorenzo the Magnificent. Lorenzo stands directly behind Cosimo. This both emphasizes his rightful place as his grandfather's successor and situates him next in line to worship Christ. 
the era of Lorenzo's de facto rule over Florence is widely regarded as its golden age. No doubt, it was artists like Botticelli and paintings such as this adoration of the Magi that made it such. While the inclusion of these members of the Medici family gives this painting historical intrigue, Botticelli did not allow the civic aspect to distract his painting from its devotional function. This adoration of the Magi was designed to be an altarpiece. It was originally placed over an altar in a chapel where the Eucharist was celebrated. To achieve this painting's liturgical purpose, Botticelli had to solve the problem of how to arrange such a large number of figures into a composition that would not obscure the sacred subject. The potential danger here was that Christ and the Holy Family might become lost among so many elaborately dressed and finely posed figures. Botticelli solved this problem in two stages. First, he adopted an innovative approach to pictorial narrative space. Second, he carefully organized the figures within his composition. In order to accommodate the Magi and their attendants, Botticelli depicted an extensive foreground space. However, by elevating the Holy Family on a hill, Botticelli was able to gather everyone around Christ without obstructing the viewer's access to the child. Having created enough space for such a large group, Botticelli's second problem was how to organize these many figures into a composition that would direct the viewer's attention toward Christ. The painting's center is organized into a triangle whose apex is Mary. This gives structure to the foreground figures and points them towards the Holy Family. Furthermore, the groups of figures standing at the left and right form their own Christ-oriented triangles. Moving from both sides, the whole painting draws towards the center. Botticelli has succeeded in designing a composition that in its very structure directs the viewer's sight towards Christ. Botticelli's composition in this adoration of the Magi spiritually orients each person in the painting toward Christ. In both what he depicts and how he depicts it, Botticelli inspires the devotional viewer to see Christ as the focal point of Epiphany. Research shows the stone. Thanks, KG. <laughs> what in that painting helps you understand what's going in this story, going on in this story? What caught your attention? Folks at home, feel free to chime in in the Facebook chat. about the um, figures in that painting and how Botticelli painted both himself in the painting, his own self-portrait, and also painted uh, famous people from one of the, the leading powerful families in the city of Florence. What's significant about that? Why would he do that? Well, the most important people of the time Yeah, that's an interesting connection. So in, in this story in Matthew, we hear about these powerful, maybe wealthy, probably very learned people who come and bow down and worship Jesus. And so perhaps Botticelli is thinking about who would be the contemporary equivalents of those esteemed, powerful, learned people. And the Medici family were patrons of the arts and sciences, in that, in that period of time in Renaissance Italy. Um, they, they were the folks who, who were really throwing money at the people who were, who were studying the natural sciences, who were doing art to, um, to portray nature and portray the human body. So I can certainly see the parallels.
okay, we've got a comment online. Byron says, this blend of civic and contemporary people adoring Christ is fascinating, healthy, since Christ is Lord of all, but could be a bit troubling, taming the revolutionary edge of the kingdom coming. Ooh. Thought provoking. What do you make of that? <clears throat> were the Medici family actually people who were committing their lives to Christ? Were they actually worshiping the baby king, giving up their own power the way the Magi did? It kind of makes you a little uncomfortable if you really think about it. You know, mm. you know, what was, and even what his motivations were for keeping it if these people were his patrons. You know, um, yeah. well, you know, just there's a little bit, it's a beautiful painting, but at the same time, there's a little bit of something in there that could make you a little uncomfortable. Yeah. Although I do love the image of him turning in, of his self portrait and inviting the viewer in to be part of the viewing crowd. I think that was a really interesting. I feel like it does keep the fact that his faith was in place, even though. He may have been needing to, for survival reasons, <laughs> respond to something else. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. I love that tension. We've got this sense of being uncomfortable with maybe just trying to to flatter these powerful people, perhaps, which is the exact opposite of what the Magi did, right? Herod gave them gave, gave them a command, and God told them, "Don't follow it," and so they disobeyed the the powerful king. Whereas maybe Botticelli is, is just flattering and trying to keep the powerful people happy. We don't necessarily know all the details, but I think it's, it's fair to ask those questions. But then at the same time, you brought up the, the real human and personal aspect of as an individual believer, as an individual person coming to, to worship Christ, who is, who is the Lord of all in all times and places, and inviting us to do the same thing. That's what I was going to say, too, that, that I always think of this as a story from the past. It's a historical blip from 2,000 years ago, and then maybe this painting is saying, maybe not, maybe not. Are we seeking Jesus, and what are we bringing that we can give? Yeah, yeah. What does it mean to take this story from the past and think of it in contemporary terms? Great. We've got another comment online. Um, it says, the Magi were outsiders non-Jews who disobeyed the Roman king. That's certainly a significant part of this story. The Magi were outsiders, religiously, geographically. Absolutely. And do we see that reflected in this portrayal? I don't know. Was there anything else about that video that caught your attention? Well, the major, the, the stable looked chilly to me. Ooh. That it wasn't a nice enclosed place where they were safe and protected from the elements. It looked a little bit chilly. Yeah, I love that. Despite all of the, like, very, you know, proper Renaissance figures, there is this, this discomfort, this primitiveness, this exposure. Yeah, interesting. I was really struck by the way the video pointed out the geometry of the painting and the symmetry and really making sure that even though it's a very crowded scene, the viewer's eyes are focused on Jesus and that that's the center point. And that the Madonna and child were even elevated above all the, the fancy people who are, who are in the foreground. There's not the neat little, you know, nativity scene, three figures on three camels, each bearing one gift. And of course, the scripture doesn't tell us a specific number of magi. We know there were three gifts, and so we often traditionally think of them as three individuals, but we don't know that for sure. But yeah, more of that, that sort of blending of the magi with the painter's self-portrait, with the political families of the contemporary times, it all sort of begins to, to, melt, to melt together a little. 
it struck me Joseph in the background. I assume it's Joseph, but I mean, again, just very, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and there really is the, the mother and the child who are, who are foregrounded. Which is certainly faithful to the scriptural accounts, where the men, by and large, are, are quiet and in the background. As we noted in a lot of our Advent readings. Which actually, in its own way, is sort of revolutionary in terms of the kingdom work, right? I mean, this, this is coming out of a world where run by men, right? You know, you have, you have this story where it's about a, a woman and a baby, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As much as the, the Magi are outsiders in one way, they're coming to worship a, a king who himself is an, is an outsider. Born to a, a poor woman, yeah. Wow. Painting to me looked. I, I think uh, Monticelli was a good diplomat in like keeping the um, keeping everybody happy, the powerful happy, by keeping them in, and they looked very grand. Um, but then also just the geometry of elevating the, the major scene, but that. Looked like it looked kind of like two different worlds because even the, the coloring wasn't as bright <coughs> and um, it, was, it was just but I think it like satisfied probably everyone and gave reference but while kind of making the, the people at the time look very grand. Yeah, well that's a great observation about two different worlds. And I think it really makes us ponder this mystery of of God becoming incarnate, you know, stepping into our world fully, being born as a human. And yet, he is also very other, you know, the son of God. Well, we're going to look at a second painting, and you may have already seen a preview here. This one is, if in the previous painting we had trouble telling who the Magi maybe even were, <laughs> this one there front and center. And this is an unusual painting, right? We've got the three magi all tucked into bed. <laughs> this is called The Dream of the Magi. And this is from uh, the Salzburg Missal, which was uh, illuminated around 1480. And this is actually, in uh, medieval and Renaissance art, a fairly common um, artistic portrayal of the three, of, you know, the magi, portraying this scene of them being asleep and dreaming. And you'll see very similar scenes in many, um, you know, illuminated manuscripts, even in the, you know, stonework of cathedrals. Um, so this is kind of a, a common theme of some paintings. Uh, for those following along at home, I'm going to put a link in the chat so that you can see the picture up a little more clearly. But what do you make of this? Have you seen anything like this before? No. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, this is um, in the 15th century. Oh, wow. This is 1480. Wow. So Salzburg? Salzburg, yeah. In, in an illuminated um, missal book, a book of, of prayers and scripture readings. Ooh, we've got one more comment about um, the Botticelli, though, before we talk too much about this. Byron says, I think it is fair to ask if the key families in Florence who were innovative may be greed-driven? Bankers were in some ways unchristian, working around the church's regulation against usury. So imagine a painting today of corrupt multinational corporation corporate leaders bowing down. We might find that today a satire. <laughs> Is Botticelli's painting satire? You know, as I was looking through different de artistic depictions of um, the visitation of the Magi, I found one that was painted in the 1940s or 50s that was this very traditional scene of, you know, three wise men around the, the mother and child. And it was um, images that were taken from a piece of Nazi propaganda of SS officers in their uniforms. Mm -hmm. And it was very disturbing. Um, I think the artist was perhaps making a satirical point. But I think that's a very fair question to ask. Were these folks perhaps uh, powerful people who were in obvious ways not following Christ's teachings? And how do we make sense of that? Yeah.
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah, it's hard to know how the Medici's were seen at that particular time. Yeah. Right? And that, it's, it's hard to know that without a great deal of research, right. I think. But I, I think this painting does do a great job of invoking those questions, mm -hmm. of really forcing us to think about what does worshiping the Christ child actually mean? How does that act of worship interact with the positions of power we occupy in the world? What does it really mean to, to bow down at the, the cradle of baby Jesus if we then go about our business in ordinary, worldly, perhaps unethical ways? But then that same baby Jesus died on the cross for all of us. Ooh, bing, yeah. There's a, a deep mystery here that's worth pondering. Well, as we're thinking about all of that, anybody have any thoughts about this one? This is strange in an entirely different way. <laughs> Reminds me of where the wild things are. Ooh, I can see that, yeah. That's a good point. Absolutely. Is that an angel or Mary or? Yeah, I, I think that's intended to be the angel who appears to them in a dream and warns them not to go back to Herod which then prompts their act of civil disobedience. What did the artist uh, call this painting? Um, the Dream of the Magi. Gotta give credit to travel in style. Yeah, really. <laughs> he was sleeping in his crown. <laughs> well, I'm gonna read a short reflection here. Uh, this is by an author named Mary Pizzullo, and this is just a, a paragraph or two about what she sees in this painting. She writes, here we have an illuminated letter from the Salzburg Missal from about 1480, portraying the Magi dreaming of the holy archangel who warned them to flee home by a different route. Never really thought about them this way, did you? All nestled snug in bed together, naked except for their crowns? Me either. Of course, nude and in the same bed was the perfectly normal way for kings to sleep in that part of Europe at that point in history. Pajamas weren't really a thing, and people slept together for warmth. Servants on the floor, nobility in the bed. I don't think most beds were nestled in a giant letter E, and I don't think that the kings wore their crowns all night, but there you go. Poor Balthazar looks like one of the Devlins from the TV show Farscape, but in defense of the anonymous monk who illuminated the manuscript, I imagine he'd never seen an actual black person from Africa in his life. He just heard they had black skin and used the expensive indigo pigment. This portrayal would have looked perfectly normal five or 600 years ago. Funny how that works. Stories are translated from culture to culture. Images are adapted and then repeated until they turn into cliches. Cliches are repeated until they practically turn into abstracts, a cluster of familiar shapes. Mary and Joseph here, the shepherds here, the angels here, and here come the magi at the end of the pageant, one black, one tan, and one white. Then you look back in history at another culture's telling of the story and laugh. It looks so strange. Strange as three pagan kings from different lands, all dreaming of the same holy archangel and returning home by a different route. And so we rediscover the strangeness, the mystery, even the comedy of the story we've heard a thousand times. May the mystery not be lost on us as we enter into this holy season. So perhaps seeing this scene from a, a strange and different angle might help us continue to ponder this mystery. What might that dream that the Magi had have been like? I think this can be a, a fruitful kind of art to meditate on, to enter more deeply into that mystery in prayer and in reflection and in imagination.
well. There's a lot to ponder there, but we are going to look in our last uh, 15 minutes here at another piece of art that talks about another event that we are um, celebrating in worship today, which is the baptism of Christ. And these two uh, biblical stories, the account of the Magi coming to visit Jesus, the baby Jesus, and then Jesus beginning his public ministry with his baptism, kind of go hand in hand. And they both serve as occasions of, of revelation or epiphany, or the Greek word that uh, some of our, orth our siblings in the Orthodox churches use is theophany. And we're gonna hear that word in this video, a revelation of God. And you're, this video, it's going to get to the art soon enough, but the first couple of minutes, or a couple of seconds or something, it shows um, <coughs> some strange-seeming scenes of people jumping into the water, doing what looks like a polar bear plunge. And this, believe it or not, in some Orthodox Christian communities, in, in the Eastern Orthodox churches, is a tradition on the Feast of the Epiphany to um, remember your baptism, remember the baptism of Christ, by jumping into the freezing water. So that's what you're gonna see. And then it's gonna talk about um, an icon of the baptism of Christ. So let's go ahead and watch this. On January 6th, Orthodox Christians commemorate the great feast of Theophany, the day when our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, at the age of 30, began his earthly ministry by going to the Jordan River to be baptized by St. John the Baptist. The name for the feast derives from the Greek word Theophania, meaning revelation of God. This is the day when the mystery of the Holy Trinity was revealed to us for the first time. This revelation is depicted in the icon of the baptism of Christ. He descends into the waters of the Jordan River as described by Matthew. And as he comes up from the water, the great revelation of the Trinity occurs. And behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The light from above signifies the presence and glory of God. The white dove symbolizes the presence of the Holy Spirit. And just as the great flood, a dove returned to Noah with an olive branch, here too the dove symbolizes God's reconciliation with mankind. Christ stands in the Jordan, blessing the water with his right hand. St. John of Damascus explains that Christ was not baptized because he had need of purification, but to identify himself with our purification. Through his baptism, Christ sanctified the waters of the world and became a model for our own baptism. John the Baptist, also known as the forerunner, the one who preached repentance and proclaimed the coming of the Lord, stands to the left with his hand over the head of Christ. He bows in reverence and looks up in awe at the revelation of God. An axe laid at the front of a tree is left as a reminder of the words of St. John to the Pharisees and Sadducees. angels on the right, although not mentioned in scripture, help maintain symmetry in the icon, an important principle in Byzantine iconography. They stand with their hands covered in humility before the divinity of Christ, approaching the mystery of God's revelation and ready to serve the creator of all as he ascends from the water. The Jordan River, personified as a man, has turned around looking at Christ along with the fish, reminding us of the verse from the Psalm 113. Through his baptism, Christ sanctifies the waters of the world 
and opens the way for our purification and regeneration through our own baptism. Through the act of immersion, we die to this world and are born again in the resurrection of Christ into eternal life. It is a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit into the kingdom of God. Jesus the Son incarnate in the person of Jesus, um, the third person of the Trinity, um, or the yeah, being baptized in the Jordan. Yeah. So we've got you know Father, Spirit, and Son, all connected, and yet all distinct, all unified. Well, to look at the. Uh Jesus as a baby and then Jesus is being baptized, it reminds me the Trinity existed, I suppose, from the time Jesus was born, but it takes time for the baby to become truly, you know, that Jesus' plans take time and that yeah. whenever I want things to happen the way I think they should yesterday already, that, that's not how, Jesus, how God works, that yeah. the, this becoming the plan it takes time and I need to learn patience. And in fact, the Trinity existed within the Godhead since before the foundations of the world. Right. Um, you know, that, that line in, the, um, in Hark the Herald Angel sing the Christmas Carol, there's a line that says, Late in time, behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Which, yeah, gets at that idea about God's timing and things taking time and things unfolding in history. Anything else? One of the points that the narrator made was about how Jesus didn't need to be baptized to be cleansed from sin or to be purified, but Jesus is baptized in solidarity with us. And in fact, it's somehow Jesus' baptism that makes our baptisms effective somehow Jesus' baptism actually is baptizing the whole world. Well, the narrator also said by Jesus' baptism he made all the waters holy. By Jesus' baptism he made all the waters holy. That's thought-provoking. And we even saw like in some versions of that icon like all the fish kind of swarming towards Jesus. Which if you've ever stepped foot in a creek full of fish, you know they usually do the opposite, right? They scatter. They, they hide from you. But those depictions of even, even the, the little the minnows in the, in, the, in the river, you know, coming towards Jesus. Well, if 
you don't mind, I'd like to read another brief reflection on this icon um, from an Orthodox writer. Um, and this focuses on an aspect that I didn't immediately notice about this painting. Here we go. Um, the symbolism of this icon is rich and deep but there is one particular part I want to focus on. Jesus is naked, or nearly so. Christ is purposely depicted with little or no clothing. But why is that significant? All throughout the creation narrative in Genesis, we see God creating and then saying it is good. Man and woman were created together in God's image. They were both beautiful, and while they lacked physical garments, they were clothed in the glory of the image and likeness of God. However, when they fell into sin, they hid in shame until God brought them garments of skin to wear, which symbolizes the sinful tendency that now obscures our true nature. Their natural beauty was transformed into an object of shame. Adam and Eve fell, and with them, creation fell. Now enter Jesus Christ, he represents the second Adam, 1 Corinthians 15. In shame and nakedness Adam hid, yet Christ comes in his majesty, both as God and man, both in glory and nakedness, completely unashamed, representing the beauty of the undefiled human made possible through him. And in the subsequent centuries, Christians were often baptized without any clothing, shedding the garments of the old man to die in Christ and be resurrected in him. But why was Christ baptized if he had no sin? While Christ was baptized in the Jordan River, it was really the Jordan and all of creation that was baptized in Christ. As the canticle for the Theophany states, at thine appearing in the body, the earth was sanctified, the waters blessed, the heaven enlightened, and mankind was set loose from the bitter tyranny of the enemy. We see the beginning of a new creation in the theophany. Things are being set right. Christ has come not only to cleanse and restore humankind, but to adopt us as heirs into his kingdom. And when we receive his glory, not only are we redeemed, but we draw all of creation with us into the final restoration. That is why creation groans in eager expectation, awaiting the glorification of the children of God. So there's a lot to ponder there. Unfortunately, we are out of time. We can't talk about it more. But I invite you to reflect on, on this idea of Christ, Christ's nature being revealed, but also Christ baptizing all of creation in this theophany, this revelation. We do have here a contemporary um, rendering of the baptism of Christ. This was painted by uh, an artist named Jerry Nowaleski, who was Polish in 1964. And we don't really have time to talk about it, but I invite you to reflect on that. And in closing, we will close with this uh, prayer for the theophany that that writer quoted in the blog post. When thou, O Lord, was baptized in the Jordan, worship of the Trinity was made manifest, for the voice of the Father bore witness to thee, calling thee his beloved Son. And the Spirit in the form of a dove confirmed the truth of his word. O Christ, our God, who hath appeared and enlightened the world, glory to thee. On this day thou hast appeared unto the whole world, and thy light, O sovereign Lord, is signed on us who sing thy praise and chant with the knowledge. Thou hast now come, thou hast appeared, O oh, thou light unapproachable. Amen. Amen. All right, well, thank you all so much for being part of this conversation, you, and do come back next time as we learn about the difficult words of Jesus. Thanks, all right.